This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the North American Review, April 19, 1907, Chapters from My Autobiography, Chapter 16, by Mark Twain. Dictated January 12, 1905. But I am used to having my statements discounted. My mother began it before I was seven years old. Yet all through my life my facts have had a substratum of truth, and therefore they were not without preciousness. Any person who is familiar with me knows how to strike my average, and therefore knows how to get at the jewel of any fact of mine and dig it out of its blue clay matrix. My mother knew that art. When I was seven or eight or ten or twelve years old, along there, a neighbor said to her, "'Do you ever believe anything that that boy says?' My mother said, "'He is the wellspring of truth, but you can't bring up the whole well with one bucket.' And she added, "'I know his average, therefore he never deceives me. I discount him thirty per cent for embroidery, and what is left is perfect and priceless truth, without a flaw in it anywhere. Now to make a jump of forty years without breaking the connection, that word embroidery was used again in my presence, and concerning me, when I was fifty years old, one night at Rev. Frank Goodwin's house in Hartford, at a meeting of the Monday Evening Club. The Monday Evening Club still exists. It was founded about forty-five years ago by that theological giant, Rev. Dr. Bushnell, and some comrades of his, men of large intellectual caliber and more or less distinction, local or national. I was admitted to membership in it in the fall of 1871, and was an active member thenceforth, until I left Hartford in the summer of 1891. The membership was restricted in those days to eighteen, possibly twenty. The meetings began about the first of October, and were held in the private houses of the members every fortnight thereafter throughout the cold months until the first of May. Usually there were a dozen members present, sometimes as many as fifteen. There was an essay and a discussion. The essayists followed each other in alphabetical order through the season. The essayist could choose his own topic and talk twenty minutes on it, from M.S. manuscript, or orally according to his preference. Then the discussion followed, and each member present was allowed ten minutes in which to express his views. The wives of these people were always present. It was their privilege. It was also their privilege to keep still. They were not allowed to throw any light upon the discussion. After the discussion there was a supper, and talk, and cigars. This supper began at ten o'clock promptly, and the company broke up and went away at midnight. At least they did, except upon one occasion. In my recent birthday speech I remarked upon the fact that I have always bought cheap cigars, and that is true. I have never bought costly ones. Well, that night at the club meeting, as I was saying, George, our colored butler, came to me when the supper was nearly over, and I noticed that he was pale. Normally his complexion was a clear black, and very handsome, but now it had modified to old amber. He said, "'Mr. Clemens, what are we going to do? There is not a cigar in the house but those old wheeling long nines. Can't nobody smoke them but you. They kill at thirty yards. It is too late to telephone.' We couldn't get any cigars out from town. What can we do? Ain't it best to say nothing, and let on that we didn't think?" No, I said, that would not be honest. Fetch out the long nines, which he did. I had just come across those long nines a few days or a week before. I hadn't seen a long nine for years. When I was a cub pilot on the Mississippi in the late fifties, I had had a great affection for them, because they were not only, to my mind, perfect but you could get a basket full of them for a cent, or a, a dime. They didn't use cents out there in those days. So when I saw them advertised in Hartford, I sent for a thousand at once. They came out to me in badly battered and disreputable-looking old square pasteboard boxes, two hundred in a box. George brought a box, which was caved in on all sides, looking the worst it could, and began to pass them around. The conversation had been brilliantly animated up to that point, but now a frost fell upon the company. That is to say, not all of a sudden, but the frost fell upon each man as he took up a cigar and held it poised in the air, and there, in the middle, 
his sentence broke off. That kind of thing went on all around the table, until when George had completed his crime the whole place was full of a thick solemnity and silence. Those men began to light the cigars. Rev. Dr. Parker was the first man to light. He took three or four heroic whiffs, then gave it up. He got up with the remark that he had to go to the bedside of a sick parishioner. He started out. Rev. Dr. Burton was the next man. He took only one whiff, and followed Parker. He furnished a pretext, and you could see by the sound of his voice that he didn't think much of the pretext, and was vexed with Parker for getting in ahead with a fictitious ailing client. Rev. Mr. Twitchell followed, and said he had to go now, because he must take the midnight train for Boston. Boston was the first place that occurred to him, I suppose. It was only a quarter to eleven when they began to distribute pretexts. At ten minutes to eleven, all those people were out of the house. When nobody was left but George and me, I was cheerful. I had no compunctions of conscience, no griefs of any kind. But George was beyond speech, because he held the honor and credit of the family above his own, and he was ashamed that this smirch had been put upon it. I told him to go to bed and try to sleep it off. I went to bed myself. At breakfast in the morning, when George was passing a cup of coffee, I saw it tremble in his hand. I knew by that sign that there was something on his mind. He brought the cup to me, and asked impressively, "'Mr. Clemens, how far is it from the front door to the upper gate?' I said, "'It is a hundred and twenty-five steps.' He said, "'Mr. Clemens, you can start at the front door, and you can go plumb to the upper gate and tread on one of them cigars every time.' It wasn't true in detail, but in essentials it was. The subject under discussion on the night in question was dreams. The talk passed from mouth to mouth in the usual serene way. I do not now remember what form my views concerning dreams took at the time. I don't remember now what my notion about dreams was then. But I do remember telling a dream by way of illustrating some detail of my speech, and I also remember that, when I had finished it, Rev. Dr. Burton made that doubting remark which contained that word I have already spoken of as having been uttered by my mother, in some such connection, forty or fifty years before. I was probably engaged in trying to make those people believe that now and then, by some accident or otherwise, a dream which was prophetic turned up in the dreamer's mind. The date of my memorable dream was about the beginning of May, 1858. It was a remarkable dream, and I had been telling it several times every year for more than fifteen years and now I was telling it again, here in the club. In 1858 I was a steersman on board the swift and popular New Orleans and St. Louis packet Pennsylvania, Captain Kleinfelter. I had been lent to Mr. Brown, one of the pilots of the Pennsylvania, by my owner, Mr. Horace E. Bixby, and I had been steering for Brown about eighteen months, I think. Then, in the early days of May, 1858, came a tragic trip, the last trip of that fleet and famous steamboat. I have told all about it in one of my books called Old Times on the Mississippi. But it is not likely that I told the dream in that book. It is impossible that I can ever have published it, I think because I never wanted my mother to know about the dream, and she lived several years after I published that volume. I had found a place on the Pennsylvania for my brother Henry, who was two years my junior. It was not a place of profit, it was only a place of promise. He was mud-clerk. Mud-clerks received no salary, but they were in the line of promotion. They could become, presently, third clerk and second clerk, then chief clerk, that is to say, purser. The dream begins when Henry had been mud-clerk about three months. We were lying in port at St. Louis. Pilots and steersmen had nothing to do during the three days that the boat lay in port in St. Louis and New Orleans, but the mud-clerk had to begin his labors at dawn, and continue them into the night by the light of pine-knot torches. Henry and I, moneyless and unsalaried, had billeted ourselves upon our brother-in-law, Mr. Moffat, as night-lodgers while in port. We took our meals on board the boat. 
No, I mean I lodged at the house, not Henry. He spent the evenings at the house from nine until eleven, then went to the boat to be ready for his early duties. On the night of the dream he started away at eleven, shaking hands with the family, and said good-bye according to custom. I may mention that handshaking as a good-bye was not merely the custom of that family, but the custom of the region, the custom of Missouri, I may say. In all my life up to that time I had never seen one member of the Clements family kiss another one, except once. When my father lay dying in our home in Hannibal, the 24th of March, 1847, he put his arm around my sister's neck, and drew her down, and kissed her, saying, "'Let me die.' I remember that, and I remember the death-rattle which swiftly followed those words, which were his last. These good-byes of Henry's were always executed in the family sitting-room on the second floor, and Henry went from that room and downstairs without further ceremony. But this time my mother went with him to the head of the stairs and said good-bye again. As I remember it, she was moved to this by something in Henry's manner, and she remained at the head of the stairs while he descended. When he reached the door he hesitated, and climbed the stairs, and shook hands good-bye once more. In the morning, when I awoke, I had been dreaming, and the dream was so vivid, so like reality, that it deceived me, and I thought it was real. In the dream I had seen Henry a corpse. He lay in a metallic burial case. He was dressed in suit of my clothing, and on his breast lay a great bouquet of flowers, mainly white roses, with a red rose in the center. The casket stood upon a couple of chairs. I dressed and moved towards that door, thinking I would go in there and look at it. But I had changed my mind. I thought I could not yet bear to meet my mother. I thought I would wait a while and make some preparation for that ordeal. The house was in Locust Street, a little above Thirteenth, and I walked to Fourteenth, and to the middle of the block beyond, before it suddenly flashed upon me that there was nothing real about this. It was only a dream. I can still feel something of the grateful upheaval of joy of that moment, and I can also still feel the remnant of doubt, the suspicion that maybe it was real after all. I returned to the house almost on a run, flew up the stairs two or three steps at a jump, and rushed into that sitting-room, and was made glad again, for there was no casket there. We made the usual eventless trip to New Orleans. No, it was not eventless, for it was on the way down that I had the fight with Mr. Brown. Note, see Old Times on the Mississippi, which resulted in his requiring that I be left ashore at New Orleans. In New Orleans I always had a job. It was my privilege to watch the freight piles from seven in the evening until seven in the morning and get three dollars for it. It was a three-night job and occurred every thirty-five days. Henry always joined my watch about nine in the evening when his own duties were ended, and we often walked my rounds and chatted together until midnight. This time we were to part, and so the night before the boat sailed I gave Henry some advice. I said, "'In case of disaster to the boat, don't lose your head. Leave that unwisdom to the passengers. They are competent. They'll attend to it.' But you rush for the hurricane deck, and astern to one of the lifeboats lashed aft the wheelhouse, and obey the mate's orders. Thus you will be useful. When the boat is launched, give such help as you can in getting the women and children into it, and be sure you don't try to get into it yourself. It is summer weather, the river is only a mile wide as a rule, and you can swim that without any trouble. Two or three days afterwards the boat's boilers exploded at Ship Island below Memphis, early one morning, and what happened afterward I have already told in old times on the Mississippi. As related there, I followed the Pennsylvania about a day later on another boat, and we began to get news of the disaster at every port we touched at, and so by the time we reached Memphis we knew all about it. I found Henry stretched upon a mattress on the floor of a great building, along with thirty or forty other scalded and wounded persons, and was promptly informed by some indiscreet person that he had inhaled steam, that his body was badly scalded, and that he would live but a little while. Also I was told that the physicians and nurses were giving their whole attention to persons who had a chance of being saved. They were short-handed in the matter of physicians and nurses, and Henry and such others as were considered to be fatally hurt were receiving only such attention as could be spared, from time to time, from the more urgent cases. 
But Dr. Peyton, a fine and large-hearted old physician of great reputation in the community, gave me his sympathy and took vigorous hold of the case, and in about a week he had brought Henry around. Dr. Peyton never committed himself with prognostications, which might not materialize. But at eleven o'clock one night he told me that Henry was out of danger and would get well. Then he said, At midnight these poor fellows lying here and there all over this place will begin to mourn and mutter and lament and make outcries. And if this commotion should disturb Henry it will be bad for him. Therefore ask the physician on watch to give him an eighth of a grain of morphine. But this is not to be done unless Henry shall show signs that he is being disturbed. Oh, well, never mind the rest of it. The physicians on watch were young fellows hardly out of the medical college, and they made a mistake. They had no way of measuring the eighth of a grain of morphine, so they guessed at it and gave him a vast quantity heaped on the end of a knife-blade, and the fatal effects were soon apparent. I think he died about dawn. I don't remember as to that. He was carried to the dead-room, and I went away for a while to a citizen's house and slept off some of my accumulated fatigue and meantime something was happening. The coffins provided for the dead were of unpainted white pine, but in this instance some of the ladies of Memphis had made up a fund of sixty dollars and bought a metallic case, and when I came back and entered the dead room, Henry lay in that open case, and he was dressed in a suit of my clothing. He had borrowed it without my knowledge during our last sojourn in St. Louis, and I recognized instantly that my dream of several weeks before was here exactly reproduced so far as these details went, and I think I missed one detail, but that one was immediately supplied, for just then an elderly lady entered the place with a large bouquet consisting mainly of white roses, and in the center of it was a red rose, and she laid it on his breast. I told the dream there in the club that night, just as I have told it here. Rev. Dr. Burton swung his leonine head around, focused me with his eye, and said, "'When was it that this happened?' "'In June, fifty-eight. "'It is a good many years ago. Have you told it several times since?' "'Yes, I have, a good many times.' "'How many?' "'Why, I don't know how many.' Well, strike an average. How many times a year do you think you have told it? Well, I have told it as many as six times a year, possibly oftener. Very well. Then you've told it, we'll say, seventy or eighty times since it happened? Yes, I said, that's a conservative estimate. Now then, Mark, a very extraordinary thing happened to me a great many years ago, and I used to tell it a number of times, a good many times, every year, for it was so wonderful that it always astonished the hearer and that astonishment gave me a distinct pleasure every time. I never suspected that that tale was acquiring any auxiliary advantages through repetition until one day, after I had been telling it ten or fifteen years, it struck me that either I was getting old and slow in delivery, or that the tale was longer than it was when it was born. Mark, I diligently and prayerfully examined that tale with this result that I found that its proportions were now, as nearly as I could make out, one part fact, straight fact, fact pure and undiluted, golden fact, and twenty-four parts embroidery. I never told that tale afterwards. I was never able to tell it again, for I had lost confidence in it, and so the pleasure of telling it was gone, and gone permanently. How much of this tale of yours is embroidery? Well, I said, I don't know. I don't think any of it is embroidery. I think it is all just as I have stated it, detail by detail. Very well, he said. Then it is all right. But I wouldn't tell it any more, because if you keep on, it will begin to collect embroidery, sure. The safest thing is to stop now. That was a great many years ago, and today is the first time that I have told that dream since Dr. Burton scared me into fatal doubts about it. Now, I don't believe I can say that. I don't believe that I ever really had any doubts whatever concerning the salient points of the dream, for those points are of such a nature that they are pictures, and pictures can be remembered when they are vivid much better than one can remember remarks and unconcreted facts. 
Although it has been so many years since I have told that dream, I can see those pictures now just as clearly as defined as if they were before me in this room. I have not told the entire dream. There was a good deal more of it. I mean, I have not told all that happened in the dream's fulfillment. After the incident in the death room, I may mention one detail, and that is this. When I arrived in St. Louis with the casket, it was about eight o'clock in the morning, and I ran to my brother-in-law's place of business, hoping to find him there. But I missed him, for while I was on the way to his office, he was on his way from the house to the boat. When I got back to the boat, the casket was gone. He had conveyed it out to his house. I hastened thither, and when I arrived the men were just removing the casket from the vehicle to carry it upstairs. I stopped that procedure, for I did not want my brother to see the dead face, because one side of it was drawn and distorted by the effects of opium. When I went upstairs, there stood the two chairs, placed to receive the coffin, just as I had seen them in my dream. And if I had arrived two or three minutes later, the casket would have been resting upon them, precisely as in my dream of several weeks before. Mark Twain. To be Continued.